Good evening and welcome. This coming Sunday is the 13th Sunday after Pentecost, though we're not really listing it as such. We are using the readings for that particular Sunday. Of course, it is also the Sunday of the church picnic, and so we have a somewhat shortened order of service that we'll be using both on Sunday and also tonight as well, and I suppose that probably won't make too many of you too sad that tonight's service is somewhat shorter than normal. Uh, we'll begin by singing our first hymn as it's printed there in the service folder, Every Morning Ner Mercy's New. rise. The Lord is gracious. His mercies haven't come to an end. Let us thank God that we are here today and ask his blessing upon this day of grace in the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. Keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings and life may please you. Into your hands I commend my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us lay our weaknesses and sins down at the feet of our faithful God and Savior, trusting him to take them away. Eternal God, you live in holiness, but we are not holy. We cannot make ourselves into the people you demand that we be. We are sinful by nature and sometimes sinful by choice. And you are even more aware of our sins than we are ourselves. You know how helpless we are. Forgive us and restore us for Jesus' sake. Jesus came to earth to rescue you. Jesus came to earth to live for you and die for you. Jesus completed his mission and all your sins have been paid for. You are redeemed, bought back from your inbred sinfulness. You are justified. For by believing in Jesus, you have already been declared not guilty in God's sight. You will be glorified, for Jesus is coming back to take you to heaven forever. Lord 
Please be seated. Our first reading this evening comes from the book of Jeremiah, where we read from verse 23 of chapter 23. Am I only a God nearby, declares the Lord, and not a God far away? Can anyone hide in secret places so that I cannot see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth, declares the Lord? I have heard what the prophets say, who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream, I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets who prophesy the delusions of their own minds? They think the dreams they tell one another will make my people forget my name, just as their fathers forgot my name through Baal worship. Let the prophet who has a dream tell his dream, but let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. For what has straw to do with grain, declares the Lord. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? This is the word of the Lord. We'll join together in singing the metrical version of our psalm for this evening, Psalm 139. Our second lesson comes from the epistle to the Hebrews, reading from verse 1 of chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. and You have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as sons, for what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And this is the word of our God. Please rise for prayer. Heavenly Father, you have granted us a great privilege that we should be called your children. Work in us by your Spirit, that we may love what is good and obey your commands joyfully. 
Bless the proclamation of your word, that error may be changed to truth, that sin may give way to repentance, and that the persecuted may be strengthened and comforted in their trials. All-knowing God, you see how we struggle with sin in our own lives, and yet in your mercy, you do not keep a record of our sins. Lord, do not let us get tired of doing good, but work in our hearts that we may show kindness and patience to all people. Heavenly Father, we continue to ask you to, to uh, according to your grace and mercy, steer the hurricane that threatens the southeastern quadrant of our country out to sea and spare life and property that is currently threatened by that storm. However, we do understand that your ways are not our ways, and your thoughts are not our thoughts. And we know that even if you do allow this storm to cause damage, among your people who, who live in that area, you will use it for their eternal good somehow. We, we ask, according to your grace and mercy, knowing that you will in all things do what is best. And preserve us from all temptations and grant us a, a strong faith that the desires of our hearts may rest in your merciful arms for the sake of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Our gospel reading will also serve as our sermon text this evening. From Luke chapter 12, we read Jesus' words that begin there at the 49th verse. I have come to bring fire on the earth. And how I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to undergo, and how distressed I am until it is completed. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. From now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated for our next song.
grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for this evening is our gospel reading from Luke chapter 12. Before the sermon, I'll just reread Jesus' words that uh, are printed there in the 51st verse. Do you think I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you, but division. So far, God's word. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth, dear Christian friends. So there was a 19-year-old who was very excited as she came out of her bedroom and bounded down the stairs one morning. She wasn't usually excited to have breakfast with her parents, but this day was different. She was excited because during the night, while her parents were sleeping, she had gone ahead and dyed her hair purple. And she was excited because she was going to show her parents how independent she was. And she was looking forward to their reaction. She didn't even mind that they were going to be angry. In fact, their anger is what she wanted. She was a middle child, and as such, didn't think that she got the attention that her older and younger siblings received. So she was excited as she popped into the kitchen where they ate their breakfast and sat down with just mom and dad, dad in front of the newspaper and mom sipping her coffee. They glanced at her, said good morning, and went back, dad looking at the paper, mom kind of looking into the coffee. That wasn't the reaction that she wanted. She was a little disappointed. So she tried to provoke them into looking at her by knocking over the cereal bowl. Whoops! And they looked over, no problem, honey, said mom, I'll clean that up. And mom gave her a big smile. And disappointed, as she went out and grabbed her coat to go catch her bus to work, she wondered what in the world had just happened. See, she didn't know that weeks before, when she had started to do other things to provoke her parents, her parents had gotten together and made agreement among themselves that they were not going to be provoked by their daughter. They were not going to overreact to her. They were going to show her love and acceptance and weren't going to fly off the handle no matter what she did. Now that can be a really wise approach to tamp down what would otherwise be a fiery confrontation inside of a family. To do so with understanding, acceptance, and love, even if the more immature person in the group is looking for that kind of confrontation, the grown-ups in the room should know better, generally. And yet it doesn't always work that way, or sometimes it just can't work that way. Sometimes foolish or outright bad behavior has to be confronted. Some family squabbles can't be avoided. There is nothing wrong with a desire for peace. Paul, in writing to the Corinthians in his first epistle that we have recorded to them, says, we are to live in peace, talking about the family unit. Most importantly, husbands and wives should live in peace. And yet, those of you who have been married for any time, you know that peace doesn't mean pretending things are all right when things do actually need to be talked about. You can't just pretend that you don't have feelings about a certain subject or that your spouse doesn't have feelings about a certain subject. Some squabbles can't be avoided. Jesus, of course, isn't just talking about the need for communication between husbands and wives, between parents and children. He's talking about the need to have real unity based on the only thing that can actually give people unity in this world. Shared faith in him as Savior. In the work that he came down to earth to do. The work that he refers to in our text when he says, I have a baptism to undergo. 
Well, in the other Gospels we read that he's already gone through the baptism of John. He's already been baptized. What is this baptism he's talking about? Well, this is a clear reference to his suffering and death. He's got to go through something. He's got to endure something. And you and I know why he has to endure something, because he's doing it for us. Only by believing in him do we receive the benefits of that which he did, that baptism that he underwent. But, but, but you and I know that already. And those of us who have been blessed to be parents, you and I have already tried to inculcate that to our children as well. What about when the children don't get it? Or just cast that knowledge off as something unimportant, irrelevant to their lives? Now that's something that can't be ignored. Did you catch Jesus talking in our text about the fire? that he came to bring on the earth, and how he wishes that fire were already kindled. You read the text in its entirety, you see that the fire that he's talking about is the, the, the disunity inside of families, where some people are holding on to the truth of God's word, and some members of the family are not holding on to God's word. And Jesus says, I wish that fire were already kindled. Because the fire will be kindled one day, one way or the other. There will be fire kindled. There will be judgment when Christ, who has been appointed as judge, comes down out of heaven to judge and declares everyone either innocent or guilty on the basis of their faith. And those declared guilty of sin, they're cast into fire. Which is why Jesus says, I wish the fire were already kindled. I wish that these things would just get hashed out inside of families here and now in this world so that, so that children would be disciplined by their parents. Yes, perhaps even forced to go to church in their youth. Yes, eventually they have to decide for themselves what it is they believe, what they don't believe. But I wish that the older members of the family would confront the younger members of the family when they fall away. Rather than simply say, well, they're old enough to make their own decisions. See, what makes people do that? What makes people cover over what should be something very worth talking about? Well, it's a desire for peace, right? Peace is a good thing. But do you know who this guy is? I know in the back you probably can't see him real well, but anyone know who this guy is? You know Dave? Boy, two weeks in a row I got you. This is Neville Chamberlain, Prime Minister of the, uh, of the United Kingdom uh, up until 1938. Famous for the phrase, we have peace in our time, because Neville Chamberlain flew over to Munich. And he shook hands with Adolf Hitler. And Hitler promised him, oh no, I'm not going to do anything else militaristic, aggressive. You make a deal with me, and you know that, that I'll keep my word. And Chamberlain flew back and told everyone, I've met Herr Hitler, and I know I can trust him. And that was 1938. And World War II started in 1939, when the Nazis invaded Poland. Oh, he wanted peace, and peace is a wonderful thing to want, but you can't always have peace. Some squabbles can't be avoided. Neither can the squabbles involving matters of faith be avoided. Not if we are sincere about what we believe. We confess, and we're going to do it in just a few minutes, that Jesus is the Son of God, that he came from heaven to earth, that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, that he was crucified, laid in the tomb, he rose again on the third day and ascended into heaven, 
And from there, what's he going to do? He's going to come down and judge the living and the dead. We might wish that there were no squabbles inside of our families, especially concerning matters of faith sometimes. No fires to put out. I'll tell you what, the fires that might erupt in our family over matters of faith, they are far less dangerous than the fire of hell that burns forever. And if we are serious about what we're going to confess, that all unbelievers will depart from the presence of God and go into hell, then we're going to be like Jesus in our text. And we're going to say, how I wish those fires were kindled now. How I wish that the people that I love here on earth now would suffer the fire of an earthly argument rather than suffer forever in hell. It was the love of Jesus that caused him to go through his fiery trial, his baptism, his suffering and death on the cross. He didn't need to earn anything for himself. He wanted you to live with him forever in heaven. And at the same time, he paid the exact same price for all of your loved ones as well. It would be a wonderful thing if we could go through life without any family squabbles, but that's just not going to happen. It's not even going to happen in the context of our church congregational family. You look at the front side of our bulletin where we put that motto underneath uh, the, uh, on the bottom of all of our bulletins now, one family under God. Does that mean in this Christian family there aren't ever going to be any squabbles? No, nope. it's not going to work that way because we are a family of sinners gathered together. Under God's grace, yes, but still with our inherent sinfulness as part of us. But far better, far better to have squabbles here on earth than to risk that which comes as the consequence of unbelief in eternity. God has seen to it that that's not something that you are going to have to deal with. And in his loving kindness, he's placed some of us in positions where we can be the instruments through whom the message of grace is extended to those that we love that they may not have to sweat that as well. Amen. And the peace of God that transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Please rise as we join in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. During the offering, uh, we ask everyone, if you are able to, please sign the friendship register in your pew. Thank you.
Please rise for prayer. Almighty God, all that we have comes from you, our bodies and minds, our strength and intelligence, our time and abilities, our energy and possessions. Guard us from the temptation to use these gifts to benefit only ourselves. Make us willing to use them joyfully in service to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please remain standing as we close with our closing song. Please be seated. Well, good evening again. And um, it would typically be the uh, weekend that we watch the Wells Connection video, but we're going to hold off on that as, uh, as most of our people will be at the 1030 outdoor service and we won't really have the means to do that, God willing. Uh, we, we do hope to have that outside. Hope to see many of you at the picnic too. Uh, we should be uh, well, if everything goes according to the way we did it today, we do have the installation as well, which will add another seven or eight minutes, but the service should only take 40 to 45 minutes on Sunday, meaning we should be able to get started with the picnic right at 11.30 as we're planning. So hope to see many of you there for that. And with that, wish you God's blessings on the rest of your week. Thank you. <laughs>